we first introduced the principle of distributed hash tables. So a distributed hash table is actually just a hash table distributed dynamically onto a set of cooperating nodes. So here's a hash table. Here on the left, we can see a hash table with keys and values. And normally, you know hash tables could be stored on one machine. But here, we're storing the hash tables on a set of nodes. We're distributing the hash table. So each node, A, B, C, and D, will store part of the hash table. And then we provide a lookup operation. That means any node, you can look up any key in the hash table. If you look up a given key and it's at the node where you're at, you get the value immediately. But if it's not at the node, you will do routing. So each node has a routing table and it has pointers to other nodes. So when you look up a key, then if it's not at the node where you are, then you will route to the node where it is. And so you can look up a key from any node. So for example, if I'm on node D, and I do look up 9, but 9 is not stored at D, it's stored on A, then the system will do a routing. It will send messages from D to B to eventually get to A, and then the answer will come back. So a famous example of DHT is a system called CORD. This was the first DHT in the early 2000s. So basically, the nodes and the items have common IDs. They're arranged in a circular space. So in this example here, we have 2 to the 4. We have 16 possible IDs in this little example. But in a real system, we're going to have much more. For example, 128 bits. So an item ID, so for example, in the file, assume we have a file that has an item ID of 2. But there's no node at 2. Well, it's assigned to the first node ID that follows it on the circle. Okay, So that's how code works. So the 2 will be actually be stored on node 3. And the, the nodes are organized around the circle on their IDs. And the node following a particular ID is called the successor. So if we have ID 5 here, there's no node here, but the successor is 6, and there's a node there. And of course, the storage is sparse. We'll have a very large ID space, for example, 128 bits, but the number of nodes is not going to be that big, and the number of items neither. It'll be much smaller, so the storage is sparse. So let's see how routing works on CORD. So we have a routing table stored at each node, and the routing table is of a particular size. So if we have 2 to the m is equal to n, which is 16 here, m will equal to be 4. Every node knows the successor, but at successively increasing distances. So 1, 2, 4, and 8 steps away. So if we're at node 1, for example, we could be at any node, and we do lookup of get 15, we will do routing. We will have to go to the node that stores the item 15. Now, item 15 is here, and it will actually be stored in the successor in 0. So how does this work? So we will do a hop now. We will go from one node to the next node. So the first hop that we will do is going to node 9, because it's the biggest hop that we can do, which is still less than 15. Then the next hop we will do, if we go now we're at node 9, and we have also a routing table at node 9 with these four green arrows. Now the biggest one will go too far. It's beyond 15. So we go to the biggest one that is less than 15. So it's the one that goes to 13. But because there's no node at 13, it will actually go to 14. So now we're at node 14. We still haven't reached node 15. We have at node 14 these violet arrows. We have its routing table at 14. And now we look, and all of them will go too far except for the first one. The first one goes to node 15. But since there is no node stored at place 15, it will actually go to the next place where there is a node, the successor, which is node 0. So that makes a three 
hop routing. Okay, from node one, we will do one, two, three hops. We will arrive at node zero where the item 15 is stored. And for 16 nodes, the maximum number of hops will be logged base two of 16, which is four. So that's the way it works. Now let's take a look at all the systems that do this. Looking at general peer-to-peer -peer systems, we have talked about unstructured ones. Remember, we talked about Napster and Gnutella hybrid and fully decentralized. There are other variations, for example, Kaza in the unstructured. And then we're talking about now the structured ones, the distributed hash tables. So I showed Cord as an example, but there are many others, Can, Tapestry, Pastry, for example. And if you look at them, there's a whole jungle of different possibilities. So here is a table of some of these peer-to-peer -peer systems according to some of the properties they have. So we have on the left columns, we have Napster and Gnutella. Notice they're not scalable. And then we have the other ones, the distributed hash tables, four of them, but there's actually many more that were designed and built. And current systems, there's many variations. So what kind of guarantees are given? Is there locality? What about replication? What about routing? So for example, in Napster, the routing table is size n. It's the directory. Now, in, uh, to read an item, though, it's very fast. You just have to do one read. Whereas in Gnutella, the reading is very slow because you're doing flooding. In the worst case, you have to look at all the nodes. But insertion in Gnutella is very fast. It's also very fast in Napster. Insertion in um, new nodes, if you want to insert a new node in Gnutella, it's slow. But if you want to insert a new node in Napster, it's fast. You just have to tell the directory. Now, if you look at the others on the right-hand side here, they are typically logarithmic, except for CAN, which is uh, a power. So CAN is basically a kind of hypercube, but both of them are much, much less than N. So the distributed hash table gives you a logarithmic behavior. So now let's take a look at this, these systems, the research issues. Let's say we want to build a DHD how do we do it? We need some, some, some solid foundation. So we need a framework. We need uh, to see how to maintain the structure. We need to see how to do queries, maybe not just lookup. We need to see how to do other kinds of services. And then there's other things, heterogeneity. What if some of the nodes are very strong and some of them are very weak, like super peers? What about locality? How do we maintain locality? If we build it randomly, then the nodes that are on the ring, they might be hopping very widely in the real world. There might be one in Belgium, one in Japan, one in Belgium. We don't want that. We, don't, we want the locality of the ring to keep the same locality as locality in the real world. Also, we want to integrate this in cloud and so on. So there's a lot of issues here. So we'll talk about a few of these issues. We're going to give a common framework, first of all. Then we're going to talk a little bit about maintaining the structure. What if there's failures? What if new nodes come in, nodes leave? We have to keep the structure. We'll talk a little bit about queries. We'll talk a little bit about group communication, such as broadcast. So this is based on a research work, uh, a framework for peer-to-peer -peer lookup services based on KRE search. So the idea is we're going to look at DHTs, all of these different families of DHTs, as a, an example of a general principle, and the principle is called distributed Kyrie search. So each node will actually be the root of a search tree with the Kyrie, so each level makes K choices. So if here on the top, if the, the circular interval, we uh, show it as a line, let's say we want to search starting from this node S. Well then, the first routing that we do will narrow the possible places where we find the result. So this is called level one. We have a K possibilities for the choices here. And then we arrive at this level where we have smaller intervals. So for each of these intervals is one over K the size. And each of these intervals has a single node, which is called the responsible node, which is the node that knows what to do for that particular interval, the routing. So for example, we can route here from S, we go to this one. Now we're 
at the second level, and we do another k airy choice, and we narrow again until we do log base k of n until we arrive at the final node. So this we have this notion of intervals that are reduced in size. So in the beginning, the result could be anywhere, and each time we make a choice, the interval where the result is is reduced. And each of these intervals has a particular node, which is called the responsible node, which is the node we route to when we go to that interval. So all of these different family of uh, DHTs that we saw, chord, pastry, tapestry, kademlia, they are using this basic principle, but with some variation, but the basic principle is the same, uh, where you have intervals and it's converging to the result. So we have n nodes. Each node is actually the root of a tree. It has a routing table, so it keeps information about a subset of the peers, not all. And then there's a trade-off, okay? If you store more information in each node, then the routing will be faster and the, route, and the number of hops will be less. So there's extreme cases. If it's, the system is small enough, then each node can keep information about all peers and you only have single hop. But if it's very huge, or just an extreme case, if you keep information about only one peer, then you will actually be doing a sequential search. So you can actually make a relation between three important values. So we have n nodes, we have the lookup path length h, and the number of routing entries stored per node, so the size of the routing table per node. So, for example, the, num the maximum path length is log base k of n. Also, the routing table is k minus 1 times log base k of n. We have k minus 1 neighbors because if you stay where you are, you don't need a log entry. So with this, you can actually make a relation between these three values. And you can see what kind of trade-off you have. If you want to have a, a, if you want to decrease the size of R, you will need a bigger H, for example. If you have a bigger R, then a smaller H will be fine. So in this framework, the chord system that we looked at is actually doing binary search. So remember in chord we have this, at each node we have four routing entries. Well, these four entries are actually levels in the tree here. So the first level, going from a big interval to the next size, which is half the size, corresponds to the, the big hop. And then the second level corresponds to when we go from half to one-fourth. This is the second level, and we have a third level and a fourth level. So basically, each node of chord has four routing entries corresponding to the dividing the main, the whole interval into half, or the half into a fourth, fourth into eighth, or eighth into sixteenth. So chord can be seen as a binary search. So if we start from node zero, we can either go to the interval that goes from zero to eight, or we can go to the interval that goes from nine, so eight open from nine, ten, eleven, twelve to 16, 0 in the other direction, so we have a choice here, k equal 2, and then if we, for example, take the choice on the right, we have another choice here, here we're from 0 to 8, and then we can go from 0 to 4, or from 4 to 8, and so on, so we have the four levels of choices, and we finally end up at a single node. So chord can be seen as a binary search. So what we do is actually we generalize chord, we generalize chord to make it a k area search. So the distributed k area search is actually kind of generalization of chord. As a final point, let's talk about the routing table size. So why does this even matter? It's logarithmic, so it's going to be very small, right? So actually, it doesn't really matter because of the storage capacity. The table is going to be small. But there's two reasons why it does matter. One is the first reason, the number of hops. So the bigger the table is, the lower the number of hops for the routing. So this might tell you you want to make the table as big as possible. But there's also a second reason, the effort needed to correct inconsistencies. 
So here we have to be worried about the dynamicity. New notes are coming in all the time. Notes can be failing. This is part of the normal operation of a DHT. It's a large dynamic system. So whenever there is an error, something happening, we have to correct the routing table because the old routing table is wrong. And the bigger the routing table is, the more effort we need to correct it. So these are two opposing uh, forces, and we have to find a good trade-off between them.